I'm going to give you an overview of what mitochondria are about and then how we can uh, think about them in a more effectively, in effective way to nourish and, and feed different parts of, of the work that you'll hear about from uh, subsequent speakers. So ultimately, life starts in the sun. And there's energy that's beamed through sunlight that hits the planet. And what happens then is that plants take that energy and then have the ability to take the carbon dioxide in the air with the water that we feed our plants and then combine this right, by in incorporating energy into this into oils, proteins, uh, sugars, right, food, su food substrates. And then a byproduct of that reaction, a happy byproduct, is oxygen. And what we do then is to, we consume this food. We eat those food substrates, we breathe in the oxygen, and then something really special happens in the mitochondria. Right? This is where the, the origin of life is for, for, for breathing animals. This chemical energy that is stored, right, the energy of the sun stored into lipids, proteins, and sugars is then transformed into this membrane potential, this delta psi. So the, this is actually a sign for the, the mitochondrial membrane potential and delta pH. So the chemical energy is transformed now into some uh, a non-molecular form of electrochemical uh, energy. And then a byproduct of this is CO2 production in water. So the exactly the reverse op, uh, opposite reaction, which then closes the, the life cycle. And this energy is basically like charging a little battery. Each mitochondrion is a, like a little battery. And that energy then can be used to fuel all of that you know, humans do. In the brain, action potentials, you're regenerating a membrane potential, uh, stress responses, neurogenesis, wound healing, the immune system, and then even the aging process, right? All of this. So thoughts, emotions, human consciousness, and the human experience are actually manifestations of this stored energy, ultimately from the sun, uh, that is kind of unpacked inside our mitochondria. So life and consciousness you could think of as being beamed uh, down to earth on a ray of sunlight. So there are a few different, two main energy transformation pathways in humans. The one on the left here is glycolysis, right? This is chemical fermentation. And we ferment carbohydrates, right? This carbon and, and oxygen that were put together. This is like burning uh, fuel, right? Like fossil fuel. The other side of things where you take, take chemical energy, you don't burn it, you transform it into this membrane potential and we do this with lipids and, and oils and proteins. And then you can store that energy into this kind of more sustainable form of energy. And then use that not just for, to make ATP, but for a number of things. Right? So mitochondria don't have one function. So the term mitochondrial function and dysfunction are a little misleading or very misleading. Mitochondria also do a lot of other things, including producing hormones. The most powerful hormones in the human body that make new life possible, right? The, the steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone that make pregnancy possible or made in the mitochondria. And the powerful stress hormone cortisol also made in the mitochondria. Calcium regulation, which is important for neurotransmission. Neurotransmitter synthesis happens inside the mitochondria. Gene expression regulation and the production of ketone bodies that we've been hearing a lot about is made in the mitochondria of specific organs, specific mitochondrial types. So what do mitochondria look like? If you want to know what something does in biology, it's typically quite useful to know what they look like. Form and forms function. So what do we do if we want to know what something looks like? In this ear of technology you're sitting in front of your laptop, you want to know what does that look like? What's, you Google it, exactly. So <laughs> you ask Google, what do mitochondria look like? And Google tells you they look like beans, right, or peanuts, depending what you prefer. There's this like internal series of membranes, it looks like a swimming pool, these are the cristae, this is where the oxygen is consumed. But if you actually have access to a nice microscope, you can make living cell with fluorescent mitochondria, put them under the microscope, then you look down the eyepiece. This is what mitochondria look like. All of these little squigglies here are mitochondria. Right? This, we're looking inside the cytoplasm here of a human cell in a dish, this is an endothelial cell of the, the blood vessels. And what you can see, I'll bring your attention to this particular pair. So these two mitochondria originally don't interact. Then there's this third one, this long one that comes along. And then they share information. And then this long one says, okay, I've had enough. And then it goes away, right? There's this whole social life of mitochondria inside the cytoplasm. And I think this is the, the, the social analogy might not be you know, too far-fetched. And there's a lot of kind of dynamic interactions that might be better captured this way. So mitochondria are more than powerhouses. 
And if we think about how we talk and think about the human body and health in general, we'd never say, you know, oh, I went to my, my GP and had my, my, my body function assessed. Right? What does that mean, your body function? Was it your liver function? Was it your cardiac function? Was it you know, maybe your brain function? Uh, so it's the, the lack of specificity in, in language actually helps uh, develop systems. Same for cell biology. It would make no sense now to talk, to talk in terms of brain cells. Are you talking about neurons? Or are you talking about astrocytes or glial cells or microglia? Um, and, and same thing for mitochondrial biology. As I'll show you, there are different kinds of mitochondria, and we need to develop specificity and language that's required. The same that we have for organ systems, for cell types, and then mitotypes. So how do we probe mitotypes in the brains and body? So if you want to know, for example, what someone is about, right? We're bound by the constraints of reductionism and what we can measure and kind of the little pieces of, of a person or a system that we can break down someone in. So if you could ask a thousand questions about someone, and you had a thousand answers, right? You could use that and get a pretty decent understanding of what this person is about. So this is basically using gene expression, what a big data set did in 50 different human tissues. So post-mortem, you can sample different tissues of different types, and then you ask, here's a thousand, 1143 specifically, mitochondrial genes. And then you ask, are mitochondria the same across a whole human body, or are they different? right, in the liver, in the brain, in different parts of the brain, in the heart, and so on. So what you see here, the point is not to understand the detail, but each row is a different mitochondrial component, and then each column is a different part of the human body, a different tissue. And what this shows, this is summarized here, is that there are different types of mitochondria. So the organs that make the ketone bodies, right, if you eat the ketogenic diet, the ketones are gonna come from the liver, mostly, and the kidneys. The ketones, are actually made inside the mitochondria of those organs. So the, mit the mitochondria and the liver are specialized not to chunk out uh, a lot of ATP, but to make ketone bodies. And you can see in this two-dimensional space here, the anabolic, so ketone-producing mitochondria here, th these are all the, the CNS, the central nervous system and the brain mitochondria. They're very different. This is here the mitochondrial abundance. How much mitochondria are there in different organs in the body? Very different. And notice all the green bars are the brain regions. Uh, the brain is one of the largest, most rich uh, organ in, in mitochondria. So there's a problem for re reductionism for complex solutions, right? Again, we're really good at breaking complex things like brains into small pieces. Everyone has seen this before, the blind man and, and the elephant. If you feel the tail, you say, oh, this is a rope. And if you feel you know, the, the, the chest of, of the elephant, you say, this is a wall. And actually, it's an elephant. But you can't see that until you, know, you, see, you see the whole thing. And that's what's been happening for mitochondrial biology. You use an ATP sensor, you say, oh, this is an ATP producing powerhouse. And then if you use a microscope, you say, oh, it's a dynamic network of organelles and so on. So what we need is an integrated dynamic perspective of mitochondria so that we can better understand it, measure them, and then uh, intervene on them. So I'll just show you two little pieces taking those principles and trying to apply them to understand the brain and to understand the mind. So the first question we ask is, how can we look at this and do those different mitotypes in the brain and in blood cells and so on? So we developed an approach where we can measure different components of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, where the electrons are transported and then where the, the magic of chemistry turning into electricity happens inside the mitochondria. So we can measure these different components. We've optimized the throughput of those assays. So you can do this in very small, pieces of brains or a few uh, white blood cells, and then you can integrate this into very simple formulas. We call this a mitochondrial health index. So now that you have this, you can do some experiments. So to start asking questions about the brain, we started with the mouse brain, which is much smaller and arguably more simple. So we took 17 different pieces of the mouse brain, and then we asked, are the mitochondria the same across a whole brain, or are they different? Right? And what you'll see now is a correlation matrix. We measured six different pieces of mitochondria across 17 different brain regions and non-brain tissues like muscle, liver, the heart, and so on. If all the mitochondria are the same, this matrix you'll see is, should be all red. Right? And this is the, the result. Right? So the point is that it's not all red. And I won't go to the details, but there's quite a bit of blue. So it looks like some animals have very high mitochondrial activity in the hippocampus, but not so much in the cortex. And some other mice have high mitochondrial activity in the cortex, but not so much in the brainstem and in the cerebellum, and so on. So now what about the human brain? So this is challenging because the human brain is big. So we had access to uh, postmortem human brains from uh, healthy 
uh, individuals. And then uh, we developed a hardware software approach to actually turn the frozen human brain into small little pieces, small little cubes at fMRI resolution. So what you're seeing here is a machine that it, the whole machine is in a freezer, so the brain is frozen. And then we're cutting the brain into these little cubes. And, and the, the end product is this, 700 little voxels for a single brain region. Then we can deploy the mitochondrial phenotyping approach, some single cell analysis, and then map this onto reference human brain maps. And this is the team of people that have done this. And here what we're trying to do is to close the gap between organellar bioenergetic profiling of the mitochondria and whole brain neuroimaging modalities. And we're doing this also in a human study called the MISB study where we have groups of patients with genetic defects in the mitochondria. And then we're asking how do mitotypes shape the human brain connectivity and, and circuitry? And we have preliminary data that we can probably tell who has mitochondrial DNA defects and who has mitochondrial energy production defect just based on patterns and signatures of, of brain activity, and we're in the process of scaling this to 500 postmodern human brains, profiling the mitochondria in multiple brain regions. So in summary, this is how we see the world. This is our mitocentric worldview, <laughs> where you have this fundamental process in the mitochondria and through mitochondrial interactions of converting energy coming up from this nuclear reactor out in the sun into utilizable, flexible, or malleable electrochemical energy in the mitochondria. The mitochondria then allow cellular functions to happen, cells to talk to each other. When you have cells that talk to each other, then that allows brain function and organs to talk to each other, which creates people that function well and then interact, can interact with each other, derives you know, sense of purpose in life and have meaningful contributions to their families and, and, their, and their environment. So there's pathways of energy transfer that make this possible. This is our team uh, that is actually doing the work, and these are the fantastic collaborators. None of this work can be done by a single group, a single team, and thank you so much to the Bazookis for allowing some of this work to happen and, and supporting this. Thank you.